Well, good afternoon, everyone at Stanford, and good morning to everyone in Asia. Uh, I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the US Asia Technology Management Center. Very happy to introduce this second session in our series of weekly public seminars on entrepreneurship in Asian high tech industries. Quick reminder for students who are taking the course for credit, your comments on last week's session are due sometime within the next week. They need to be submitted to me by email with a copy to Kimberly, who is right here, uh, within uh, two weeks of the session that you're commenting on. So a different email for each week of the course. But we're very happy to welcome all of our uh, public this is a public forum and we're happy to welcome each and every person here and especially want to express our appreciation to the member companies of the US Asia Technology Management Center Industry Affiliates Program for your financial support. This is how we're able to put on this series as well as all of our other programs. So today, I'm very excited that we've got a great panel to talk about the situation with entrepreneurship in the Philippines. Today, our first speaker is going to be Ms. Minette Navarrete, who is the vice chairman and president of Kickstart Ventures. She is a member of the Ayala Corporation's Innovation Advisory Council and of GLOBE's Innovation Advisory Board. She's a senior vice president of Globe Telecom, focusing on new business. And she's a member of the board of directors of AdSpark, which is Globe's digital advertising subsidiary. She's held CEO and COO positions in various industries, ranging from scrappy Philippine startups to uh, iconic global companies. Uh, she and her team founded Kickstart Ventures in uh, 2012 which is a wholly owned Globe subsidiary. As a corporate venture capital firm, Kickstart invests globally providing capital, mentoring and market access to early and early stage, early growth stage uh, tech startups. The portfolio, portfolio currently includes uh, over 45 companies in eight different countries. Along with Binet, we're happy to, to uh, welcome two of the companies in her portfolio. First, representing Edamama, which is Ms. Bela Gupta de Souza. And Bela is the founder and CEO of uh, Edamama, which is a digital platform for mothers in the Philippines to do e commerce in regard to childcare products and services. And also, uh, Bella's interesting in that she grew up in India and now lives in the Philippines. Finally, uh, we have two representatives from Kubu, which is a social entertainment app for Filipinos in over 50 different countries. And found, joining us are Mr. Roland Rose, who is the founder of Kumu and also Mr. Rex Dorado, who is president and co-founder of Kumu. This is a live stream community app that um, connects Filipino diaspora leaders to high impact organizations in the Philippines. So I'm really looking forward to how things are going down uh, at your end of this connection. First of all, Minette, would you give us your prepared remarks? Hi, so good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Richard and Kimberly, for inviting us. Um, so my name is Manette Navarrete. I run a venture capital firm called Kickstart Ventures in Manila. Um, so we're happy to share a few perspectives today on the tech startup ecosystem in the Philippines. Um, it's a Philippine spotlight. We, um, Bela, Roland, Rexy, and I jointly decided to call Sinigang Valley. Um, I have gallery view on, so is there anyone in the audience guessing what Sinigang is as I look through? I think you have to stop sharing the slide to get back to gallery view. 
I can actually see you folks. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> on the side. Um, in the interest of time, um, let me see. So, Sinigang. Um, for those of you with Filipino friends, you might have guessed if it's a Philippine reference, it's probably food. So in this case, it is a traditional dish. It's a savory stew. It's made with a sari ingredient and a veg and a protein. Most every Filipino will have a memory of sinigang, but there isn't a definitive recipe. Um, the sarring agent is kind of traditionally tamarind, but it can be limes or tomatoes or watermelon or guavas. Um, at the veg is whatever happens to be in season. The protein is whatever the cook fancies, so it can be pork or beef or chicken or shrimp or fish. So it's never quite the same thing, but it's always the same thing. Um, and I guess a bit like tech startups and venture capital and how they evolve in the Philippines. The Philippines is Southeast Asia's second biggest consumer market after Indonesia. Um, so 20 years ago, I'm going to say, the Philippines was called the texting capital of the world. Um, and, you know, somebody, as, as someone working in telecoms at the time, we were sending, people were sending and receiving for, on our network alone over a billion messages every day. Um, Ten years ago, it was called the social cap social media capital of the world. Um, and I remember at the time we were um, running a number of promos with, um, gosh, at the time, early stage Facebook, um, Twitter, Yahoo. Five years ago, Time magazine called Manila the selfiest city in the world. So as you can see from the stats on the slide, uh, 110 million population, 152 million um, mobile connections. Um, the Philippines is quite social, quite mobile, quite novelty seeking. We love digital, or at least that's one thing as a venture capital firm we bank on. Um, but maybe just a quick thing of, um, Professor Dasher has asked for a little bit of an introduction. So how did we get here? Kickstart Ventures started a little over nine years ago. There were three people who had less than $3 million. And this is not by any means extraordinary. I was looking at the kind of the origin stories of a bunch of um, venture capital firms based in Singapore and Malaysia. Um, and it's typical to start with a with a fund of maybe just five or six million dollars. Um, so certainly when when we set off, this was probably the smallest fund um, around. Um, Kickstart was an experiment, really. There wasn't a startup scene in Manila. I had worked for a startup once, but my entire experience is really at corporate. Um, so th there were lots of questions about, could we build a startup-friendly incubator? Could we help develop the innovation ecosystem um, in the country from inside a large revenue-focused, um, largely bureaucratic telecoms firm? Um, we didn't know. We didn't know if we could do that. We said as much to our board. Um, we said there was only one way to find out. So we spun ourselves out. Um, kind of like burning our boats to see what we could build. That was in 2012. Um, and you can see the theme around which we were going to incubate startups was, was very broad, just a digital transition for um, consumers and corporates. Three years later, we figured we could do more as a corporate venture capital firm. So we pitched to the Globe Board. Um, got a fresh $50 million fund, got extra cash for the first fund. Um, so this time we were looking to invest globally in something a little bit more strategic, um, classic TMT theme, um, telecoms, media associated technologies. Um, 
and that's kind of the the way we were building up um, experience and expertise, I suppose. Um, so we started to make investments. Um, we invested in startups um, in the US, in Canada, in Israel, in Singapore, in Indonesia, and Malaysia. So seven countries in, we thought, what was there beyond telecoms? And of course, what was there was quite a lot. Um, I think we had learned looking at our experience by then was that cash is a commodity, but could we combine capital and corporate resources, whether it's um, its actual physical infrastructure or distribution networks or industry talent and experience, relationships, commercial deals, um, could we bring all that together to help startups grow and to help nurture what was then still quite a quite a young Philippine ecosystem? So in 2020, last year, we launched our third fund, a $180 million um, global fund to add to the first two funds that are still um, live and active. So today we manage nearly a quarter of a billion US dollars in assets. We invest globally um, rather differently. We're not, we're not theme advisors. We're not focused on this tech or that tech. Um, the firm that we represent, um, Ayala Corporation, is the first business house in the Philippines this year. It turns 187 years old. And so the way we invest is to imagine the kind of future that we believe in. Um, and, and those are the themes that you will see on your screens. We imagine a frictionless future where transactions and transfers of data and value are, are seamless, are efficient, are convenient. Um, we imagine a world that shifts from pure automation the augmentations, the future of capital, where the future of work, where human capital is, is still central. Um, so we're not looking at ways with which to eliminate jobs. We're looking at ways to enrich jobs, to improve engagement. We're also looking at smarter living. So kind of imagining how um, the value of property isn't just about the value of the piece of land and the brick and mortar um, built on it, but it's how do we build communities and cities and citizens that are safe and secure um, and engaged. Ha, sorry, alarms everywhere. Um, the fourth theme is probably my favorite, um, and this is a theme called A World of Plenty. It is looking at resource allocation and distribution in the world. You know, it's it's 2021 um, and we still have places that don't have running water, that don't have adequate energy. Um, and the thought behind it is, can we begin to think of scarcity, of the scarcities that the world experiences or the parts of the world um, experience as not a supply issue, but a distribution issue. And we posit that hypothesis because technology is quite a good solution to um, distribution issues. So those are kind of the four themes that animate the fund. Um, now, 2020 was maybe not the most auspicious year to start a new fund um, in Southeast Asia. And if you look at the stats on venture fund formation, um, in terms of new funds or new capital being raised in Southeast Asia, the region was down nearly 40%. Every Southeast Asian market, including the two biggest ones, Singapore and Indonesia, announced less new cash for venture capital investments. 
with the sole exception of the Philippines, where we raised a record as a market, um, there was a record $230 million of fresh venture capital funding. So, of course, $180 million of that was um, our third fund, the active fund. Um, so while the aggregate Southeast Asian region was in hunker down mode, a few funds were indefinite soldier on mode. The capital, uh, which is a fund that some of you might know as the Singapore based firm of um, former Facebook co-founder Ed Saverin. Um, they raised $820 million um, and launched it last year. MDI and Indonesian Telco raised $500 million um, last year. So these two firms, um, plus Kickstart Ventures Active Fund, were the three biggest um, raises for new capital, dry powder, uh, for the region. Um, all the firms invest in multiple markets, but they are based in um, Southeast Asia. Now that's only half the story. That's the, um, you know, this nearly $2 billion um, that you see here um, raised from Southeast Asian um, venture capital firms. The second half is this number, the more than $4 billion um, closed by global venture capital firms in 2020 that have a Southeast Asian allocation or focus. So that's nearly four times the size, uh, the amount of capital that was raised for Southeast Asia by global funds last year. Um, and these are familiar names, Sequoia, Lightspeed, Mass Mutual. Um, so these global funds, anecdotally, when we talk to other investors, we do see a growing presence of global venture capital um, funds looking at Southeast Asia and looking for opportunities to invest, including um, in companies um, in the Philippines. So that's, that's on the side of investors raising funds. But what about deals? What about the VCs actually deploying the capital. So while fund formation for VCs was kind of subdued last year, there was still a record amount of cash, of, of dry powder raised from previous years. So you can see that in terms of deals, startups continued to raise funding through 2020. Um, you'll see over here, um, more deals. So from 494 deals in 2019 to 622 deals, um, more or less 8.2, 8.6 billion um, dollars deployed. Um, that's true for the Philippines as well. In fact, in, in the Philippines, there were more deals um, and more capital. Now, obviously the Philippines coming from quite a low base, um, but growing, which is always a good thing. Um, obviously not everyone got funded. Um, you'd have seen from the previous slide, we um, Deal Street Asia cites just about 23 Philippine deals in 2020 um, and companies in travel, in hospitality, um, retail, recruitment, all had a rough year. But there were bright spots in the Philippines, for sure. So where did the dollars go? FinTech took about half of the investment funding um, as mobile wallets and payment gateways skyrocketed in a country that needed cashless payment solutions. So the Philippines is a country with 110 million population, 150 million mobile connections, but only 35 million bank accounts and about 7 million credit cards. So new solutions um, for cashless and for remote payment um, grew 
pretty quickly last year. Um, other things that grew, e-commerce and logistics, as um, people substituted, you know, retail that was closed down and purchased everything from groceries to um, meals to booths um, online. Um, entertainment equally, whether it was in video streaming, audio, e-games, um, creator economies. So this is kind of where the money was going for um, venture capital in the Philippines last year. Um, another way I thought to answer the question, where did the dollars go, um, is to talk to the founders. Um, so I'm thrilled to share the panel with three founders whom we love, who, who can talk about where for some of our dollars went. Um, Bela's Actually, got a uh, great- Mineta, before you go on and introduce the founders, a couple of questions have come up and I think it makes sense to take care of them right now. So sure. first of all, uh, Tiho has asked if there are any FinTech unicorns in uh, the Philippines or around your vision. Uh, he specified valued at more than $500 million US, but I think probably we should keep the regular, you know, $1 billion. <laughs> uh, if, we, if we stick to the billion dollar definition, there are no billion dollar startups in the Philippines of okay. any sort, whether it's FinTech or any of those. Um, okay. There are a couple of Con companies that have reached val in fintech that have reached valuations of over 500 million dollars uh, in the Philippines. These tend to be mobile wallets that are um, grown out of telecoms companies. So one, um, the company that I work with, um, Globe. Mm -hmm. um, so they run a company called GCash. Um, which grew from, I think, 10 million um, users to 30 million last year. Um, the transaction um, volumes have increased as well. Um, they are actually now partly owned by um, Ant Financial, the um, fintech firm of Alibaba out of China. Um, and last year they got investment out of Bow Wave um, from New York. Um, so the valuations for those are um, above 500 million. Similarly, the second, so that's the largest mobile wallet in the Philippines, the second largest one, a wallet called Baymaya is also um, above $500 million in valuation. Okay. The uh, second question is from Elisa, who is joining us from Taiwan. And she asks how you decided on the size of the second and third funds. Were the corporates in the Philippines generally supportive when it comes to doing external innovation like your, like your funds allow? Um, the honest answer is I raised as much as I could get away with. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that's, you know, what can I say? Um, particularly for the first and second funds, we didn't know how many startups there would be around the Philippines. We didn't know there hadn't been a corporate venture capital firm in the Philippines. Um, so we knew nothing. Um, and here's what we knew. And we did say this to our board. We will not know unless we announce a fund and if we announce a fund, we, we must invest the fund. Um, it is a point of integrity. Um, so like I said earlier, we were an experiment. By the time it got around to the, um, to the third fund, the $180 million, at this point, um, we had actually had one exit. So we had um, a mobile wallet, coins.ph, um, set up by somebody who had come to the Philippines a few years back. Um, and we had had uh, a good return on that exit. So there was a little bit more credibility. 
um, we were also um, investing in quite interesting companies um, that were beginning to engage um, in commercial deals with um, corporates. In fact, um, from a kickstart perspective, our KPIs include metrics for capital deployment as well as relevant engagements between um, startups and corporates. So we count how many introductions we're able to make. Are there any deals that are closed? Um, and I think that's important because when we had said, you know, cash is, cash is a commodity. There's always going to be a firm with more capital than we have. Um, what we offer uniquely are the relationships, um, our ability to help some to help some companies grow in the market. Um, the the third fund, I think. Perhaps they would have wanted me to have a little less capital. I said we needed a little more. Um, so I wish I could say there was a science, Richard. But um, it's also, I think it's necessary from the optics point of view. The Philippines is not associated with venture capital or innovation. Um, so I just felt if we raise a small fund, um, it really wasn't going to make um, a dent in kind of the consciousness of people. So I wanted a serious commitment because that meant that corporate executives would pay attention and a serious commitment so that we would have the ability to not just in invest in companies but follow on. So as the companies grow, um, we should be able to help them grow and continue to fund um, and participate in subsequent rounds. So I, I wanted to have a big enough fund for that. Thanks, Mineta. That's a very good and candid answer. I really appreciate you being so open about this. Uh, we'll come back to questions about venture capital in the discussion session. Uh, for now, please continue with uh, your introductions. Anyway, I was just going to wrap up and say, um, Bela, Roland, and Rexy, they've got great stories to share. Um, I always think that the founders are the best part of the ecosystem um, and the stories that uh, on which the ecosystem will grow. Um, Roland and Rexy, incidentally, coined the phrase Sinigang Valley. So you can ask them what <laughs> they meant by it. Um, but I love the phrase personally. I think it's great. Um, I think it captures the scrappy spirit of startups in the Philippines. I think, you know, unlike Silicon this or Silicon that, um, Filipinos, like, like many Asians, um, you know, food is very central. Um, and also, Filipinos are frankly not known for being super by the book. Um, in the same way that every cook makes sinigang in a way that's at once familiar and also new and different, I think startup founders um, in the Philippines are tackling persistent problems with resourcefulness and creativity and, and joy and, and soul, frankly. Um, so I, I hope it's, it's a useful little introduction. Um, and I am looking forward to hear Bela and Roland and Rexy share their stories. Happy to tackle questions as and when. So that's kind of Thank it you. for me. Thank you very much, Mineta. Why don't we go ahead and ask Bela first? Bela, tell us about Edamama and how you got into this. Well, firstly, Richard and Kimberly, thank you so much uh, for having me and, and um, Rexy and Roland and Minette uh, joined this panel today. Um, also, thank you to all the participants. I, I believe we have people dialing in from, from different parts of the world. So good evening or good morning to you, wherever you may be. Um, it's extra special for me to be here today, uh, both representing the Philippines, but also talking to the Stanford community at large. Uh, I am a Stanford GSB class of 2011. Alam uh, was fortunate enough to 
uh, get my MBA actually from from the GSB, uh, in, and you know was I would definitely say was uh, amongst the, the best years of my life. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my journey um, from you know to the GSB and and from the GSB to to the Philippines, um, and and tell you a little bit more about Edamama as a as a venture and what we're trying to do with that. So, um, just as a quick introduction uh, to myself, firstly. Um, so I'm Bela. Uh, I am the founder of edamama.ph. We are a very early stage venture at the moment. So we're, we're about 10 months into our journey in the Philippines. I think what you'll appreciate about today's panel discussion is I can um, share perspectives as firstly a foreign founder living and working in the Philippines, but also as someone who is quite early on in their journey um, with, with setting up and scaling Edamama and kind of having just recently concluded um, our, our first institutional funding round. Um, so happy to share any perspectives you may be looking for um, as, as an early stage founder in the Philippines. Um, Rexy and Roland uh, are you know, a few years ahead of us, but I'm really honored to share the panel with them. I think if there was um, any ambassador for the Philippine startup ecosystem, it's definitely the founders of Kumu and, and Minette um, as a VC representative for Kickstart. So a little bit about myself. Um, as you can tell, I, I'm not Filipino. Um, I'm actually originally from India, as, as Richard mentioned in the introduction. Uh, but I had a bit of an unconventional upbringing. Uh, when I was three years old, uh, while most migration stories involve Indians going to the US or, or the West, my family actually moved East. So uh, as a three-year-old, I found myself in Kobe in Japan. Uh, you know. Uh, there weren't a lot of immigrants at the time in, in, a, in a very sleepy uh, seaside town uh, near Osaka. And uh, I found myself having to assim assimilate very quickly, uh, had to learn the local language, um, but really had um, what I would say is a really blessed upbringing um, and, and a very early exposure to international cultures um, and kind of getting out of your comfort zone. Um, after uh, spending several years in Japan, my family actually moved to Thailand, where I finished high school um, and then uh, decided to come back to India for college. So went to undergrad in Mumbai um, and I started off my career actually with uh, one of the largest uh, companies in India in the, in the IT space as a brand manager. And I think my experience there, I was with a company called Infosys. It really exposed me to the power of entrepreneurship. I think that's really where the spark um, into becoming an entrepreneur really kind of um, uh, ignited for me. Um, the founders of Infosys um, had paid up capital of $250 and you know, have now turned Infosys into a multi-billion dollar organization. So I was definitely very inspired by that. And it was a big reason why I, I decided to pursue an MBA. Um, I was very set on going to Stanford, was very, very fortunate um, to, to get in. Um, and you know, it was a, a very transformative time for me going to business school in the U.S. And um, you know, for more reasons than one, um, it was a, a great opportunity for me to really switch career paths and 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 pursue a more entrepreneurial track. It, Stanford is also where I I, uh, I hate to admit it, but I, I also got my MRS degree uh, with my MBA. So I actually met my now husband. Um, he was assigned to be my GSB buddy, so he took his job very seriously. Um, we've been happily married uh, since uh, since very quickly after graduating, actually. Um, and I think one of the things that really um, you know we connected on very quickly was our common desire to. Um, you know, be entrepreneurs, to create impact through startups and to be, you know, be back in Asia. Um, my husband also is originally from India, but grew up um, in different parts of the world. And I think for us, you know, as we were leaving um, the GSB, we, we knew we had the opportunity to be very comfortable and maybe stay on in the Silicon Valley, take a job in consulting or, you know, join a tech startup as a product manager. But I think what really excited us was, you know, to go into the unknown, so to speak, right? Um, never in a million years did we think that would mean the Philippines um, for us, but as fate would have it, um, uh, my husband's work actually brought him to Manila in 2012. We thought we would stay for a couple of years, but it's now been almost a decade. Um, and, you know, we've started several companies together um, in the Philippines and we've had two children who were born here. 
as well, um, and you know, very much identify as as Filipinos as heart at heart. Uh, sorry. Um, while um, so, right after the GSB, um, I I knew I wanted to pursue a, a startup track, but I knew I wasn't ready to go do something completely on my own. So uh, when I was uh, back in 2011, Groupon was expanding aggressively around the world, and I thought it would be a great launch pad for me to come back to Asia and be part of something entrepreneurial without having to, to kind of fly solo with this. So I took the job, moved to Thailand where I had anyways grown up and finished high school, um, launched Groupon's operations in Thailand. That was a really fun experience for me. In, in a year, we were able to scale it to almost 100 people, had a really successful launch in market. And that was the time where, you know, we made the personal decision to move to the Philippines um, for, for my, my husband's work. and. Um, you know, the rest is history, as they say. Um, I very quickly on after moving to the Philippines got connected to um, Minet actually, um, and, and the Globe uh, Telecom organization at large. Um, and I think one of the most amazing things about um, companies like Globe in the Philippines is that they play a very pivotal role in the startup ecosystem um, by incubating startups within uh, within their umbrella brand. So I was brought on board as an entrepreneur in residence. Um, Globe uh, always knew that it had a right to play in the digital marketing space with all the, you know, very rich customer data that they had. Um, so kind of piggybacking off that, we 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 incubated and launched um, AdSpark. Minette, in fact, still sits on the board of AdSpark. Um, and that was my first experience as an entrepreneur in the Philippines um, with, with apron strings. Uh, still attached um, to the mothership, but it was a great experience, a great way for me to discover the Philippine market uh, more intimately. And AdSpark today is a full services digital marketing agency, still going very strong. I was there for all, over four years. Um, and around that time, you know, we also started a family. We have we have two kids now, and they were really the inspiration for me to, to um, you know, start Edamama, which is a company that's really focused in the parenting space. But I felt that with the experience behind me as a, uh, you know, as a founder of Ad AdSpark, I felt more confident um, in, in my understanding of the Filipino consumer and the Filipino market more generally. And so Edamama is really now, uh, I guess, a culmination of that entrepreneurial desire to, you know, th that dream I had to kind of start my own company completely as a solo founder one day. So that's kind of where we are um, at the moment. I'll tell you more about the why behind Edamama. Why why did we decide to start this venture, and and you know what are, what has our journey been um, thus far? I think we all get to a point in our lives at some point where you know passion really drives um, a lot of our purpose. And for me, I found myself after having become a mother very drawn into this idea that you know, as a consumer and as a kind of gatekeeper for my family's needs, um, I wasn't finding um, the right support that I needed through the digital channels that I was seeking out help as a, as a new mom, especially living in the Philippines. Um, and I knew from my work experience at AdSpark, you know, when we were working with corporate clients from all industries, um, you know, mothers are a very sought after demographic. Everybody really wants to be able to target moms. I think in the Philippine context, that's also because it is a matriarchal society. Women are highly empowered. They are in some ways the chief uh, decision makers of their households. Um, so the way we see it uh, at Edamama is that young mothers are really the most engaged consumers and influencers uh, in their own right, but their, their consumer journey is uh, online, especially is really far from ideal. And the, the main pain points we experience, firstly, is that it's very fragmented. Um, if you have a baby and, um, you know, or, or you're pregnant and expecting, um, it's a very overwhelming time in your life. And you kind of seek out digital channels, whether that's blogs or social media forums or websites, shopping sites to kind of help simplify your choices um, as a consumer. But it's highly fragmented. So you'll find yourselves joining all sorts of different forums and newsletters and, 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 and uh, shopping sites. And, and um, it, it, it could be a little bit more unified as an experience. Also, um, something that perhaps we take for granted in, in um, you know, more mature markets around the world for digital is, um, you know, in the Philippines today, quality and trust are still, uh, you know, concerns amongst consumers. Um, it's, it's, not, um, it's not unlikely for you to buy something online and then receive a counterfeit uh, product or find something that is not of the same quality as you expected. And, and it's actually also very hard to return products. So, 
we saw an opportunity to, to actually build a platform of trust where mothers didn't have to think twice about where their product was coming from and whether it was vetted for safety and quality. Um, the other final point here is, um, you know, shopping online in the Philippines today is a very search led experience. You go onto a platform and, the, you know, you're kind of the first thing you're expected to do is type in a search bar. But parenting is not a simple journey. You know, it starts with a pain point, a challenge, a problem, a symptom that you're trying to solve for. So discovery and content as an enabler of commerce is very important and, and that's fundamentally lacking. Um, and so we, we really believe that mothers are looking for a more discovery led um, shopping experience. Um, and that's kind of what really um, informed us as we were as we were dreaming up the, the platform and the vision for, for Edamama. Juxtaposing these insights with just macro trends, Minette's kind of gone into some of these, so I won't I won't um, you know go into too much detail, but you know, there are some macro factors too that are really making um, you know the, the 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 industry for for the vertical offering for mother and child very um, very promising uh, in this market. Um, so um, you know, this is a part of the world where people are still having babies. Um, in fact, uh, whether you see that as a blessing or, or not, um, you know, COVID has actually accelerated that even further. We have 2 million babies born um, this year in the Philippines and, and expected to continue. Um, it's the second highest birth rate in the region. We have the highest under 14 population regionally. We're a top 10 baby population globally. Um, and juxtaposing that with e-commerce um, and, and consumer behavior, you know, the, the Philippines is going to be a $15 billion e-commerce market by 2025. We're the second fastest growing e-commerce market in Asia at the moment. We, we really lag um, in the region in terms of just penetration of e-commerce and, and um, number of transactions. So it's, it, it, it's expected to grow very rapidly over the next few years and COVID has certainly accelerated that. Manette touched upon the fact that we, are the, we have been kind of titled the social media capital of the world. If you look at Facebook penetration in the Philippines, we are number one um, globally in terms of the, 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 the percentage of population that has, has an active Facebook account. And then, as mentioned previously, you know, this is a very matriarchal society, women are empowered. You see this across Southeast Asia, actually, where women are tasked as being kind of the chief decision makers and gatekeepers of their household. So why not build a platform and an experience that really, that really helps them um, make those decisions in a much more efficient way? So with that context, um, we set up Edamama 10 months ago. Uh, interesting fact for you all here is a week before we were gonna take the platform live, COVID happened. Um, so we had to cancel all our launch plans. This is uh, about a year ago, March of 2020. Um, and you know, it's been an incredible journey for us since then. So we, we, um, we were delayed by a couple of months um, with respect to our launch. We officially went live in May on Mother's Day, uh, May of 2020. Um, and, you know, we've seen very strong growth on the platform since then, um, you know, with moms and, and families now, for the most part, um, being indoors, um, you know, the Philippines has um, unfortunately not yet come out of, um, you know, COVID uh, restrictions. Um, we think e-commerce has really been one industry that is, you know, experiencing tailwinds um, uh, as a result. And so even for Edamama, even though we were a new brand in market in some ways, um, just the fact that people were home and we were able to give them access to essentials and non-essential products for their children um, during what has been a very tough time for, for many people was very a very powerful enabler of growth for us. Um, what I'm also really proud of is that, um, you know, we had to build a virtual team from day one. You know, we didn't, we have spent very little time as a company actually getting to know our people um, physically, right? We've been in lockdown for, for almost a year now. And so it's been a very interesting social experiment for us to build a virtual team. Uh, we're almost a hundred people now, 70 in the corporate office, about 30 people in our warehouse. Um, and, and it's been, you know, quite the quite the adventure building this venture um, but it's just been um, you know we, we're, we're very fortunate that we can actually employ people at this time we, we have seen accelerated growth in the business um, and we're building a platform that mothers are coming to trust and love um, in the Philippine market. That's a fantastic introduction thank you very much Bella uh, this this is pretty much your prepared remarks right? Yes. 
Okay, <laughs> so before we go on to talk to Rexy and Roland, I have a quick follow up question for you. Sure. So, did you have to unlearn any of the lessons about entrepreneurship you learned at Stanford when you started your uh, either of your startups in the Philippines? Yes, uh, we had to unlearn a few things actually. Um, <laughs> and I, I actually, it's been, uh, it's a great question, Richard. I think that, um, you know, there, I think there's definitely. I think Stanford does a great job actually of building curriculum that's very international in nature and focus. Um, uh, I think uh, there are some aspects to, to working and living in Asia um, that is probably still not um, as uh, widely discussed uh, or covered in, in, in the MBA program. And that's, that's fair, right? I, I think it is. Yeah. At the end of the day, a U.S.-based program. I think one of the one of the key leadership principles that both my husband and I have have come to learn and appreciate about uh, working in the Philippine context is there is really no attempt at separating work life and personal life. Right. Um, I think that's really uh, one of the first things that that uh, strikes you as a foreigner working and living in this in this country. The more you connect at a personal level, actually, with your people, the better work you get, um, you know, and productivity you get from your people. And so, um, sometimes the li lines are a bit blurred, um, but we've we've seen that to be a very powerful um, type of culture to build as an organization. So I'd say that's one example of something that we kind of had to to unlearn a little bit um, and adjust uh, for this market. And I think it's something that we would we we would say is actually perhaps a more effective way to to build trust and 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 company culture. Thank you. That's that's again. Thanks for a very candid answer, and that's great. For now, let's uh, move on to uh, Kumu and sure. Roland, Rexy. I'm not sure which one of you wants to speak first. Um, the floor is yours. Awesome. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> yeah, super excited to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm usually waking up right now. <laughs> yeah. So cool. So uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and, and open up uh, just really highlight uh, and, and quick introduction, high level overview and uh, Rexy will follow uh, with some metrics and updates. So yeah, so basically uh, from, a, uh, from a quick storytelling, uh, you know, actually I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I'm actually a Filipino American. And, um, you know, one of the things is my mom really never encouraged or talked about the Philippines uh, that much. So I was always curious about the Philippines and um, yeah, ironically, it was things like in high school, I actually had a very formative summer uh, studying at Stanford. I, uh, I remember uh, uh, I lived at Roble Hall and just had such an amazing time there, uh, you know, taking law classes because, you know, my mom wanted me to be a lawyer and I ended up rebelling and going to the biggest party school I could find, which was the University of California, Santa Barbara. And so at, at UCSB, though, uh, we had a opportunity to uh, study abroad and uh, the Philippines was there and that was my chance. I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. And I actually uh, took that chance and had a life-changing uh, study abroad experience where I knew in my heart that I wanted to be in the Philippines. I felt more at home in the Philippines than I did back home in Los Angeles. And so from that experience, uh, after graduating, I, I became an entrepreneur, uh, had an experience um, exiting a, a startup in, in Silicon Valley. And with those resources, I was finally able to go back uh, to the Philippines. And uh, a lot of that was mostly in a humanitarian capacity, uh, a lot of clean water projects, poverty alleviation, HIV AIDS, um, you know, anti-sex trafficking projects and, and things like that. And um, I would have this back and forth cadence, you know, community service work in the Philippines, and then back home in the US, I would be an entrepreneur. And then with those resources, I would go back to the Philippines, do community service. And so this back and forth cadence basically every year. And so that's how I actually met Rexy. 
Uh, Rexy uh, at the time had founded a nonprofit when he was a student at, at Brown University, and it was a really engaging uh, fellowship that looked for promising Filipino students around the U.S., around the U.K., uh, you know, people from Canada. I mean, we're talking students from, from Stanford, uh, Filipino students at Harvard, Georgetown, Brown, University of Toronto, University of London, and they would engage in these life-changing internships in the Philippines. And when Rexy told me about his story, it reminded me of the same life-changing experience that I went through when I was in college. And so I just wanted to help him out because these stories of Filipino students rejecting their job offer at Amazon to start an AI company in Manila, or they would have an opportunity to be an investment banker in New York, but instead would uh, help a family business in, in Manila as well. And so story after story uh, helping Rexy out, uh, we caught the attention of the Philippine ambassador uh, to the United States. His name is uh, Ambassador Jose Quisha. And we had this conversation where he was really encouraging us that, hey, look, there's all this, you know, the things that Manette and, and Bella are talking about are very true. He was talking about digital transformation, the World Economic Forum, and all the middle-class jobs that are going to be created in the Philippines over the next five to 10 years. And he's like, look, Roland, we appreciate the fact that a lot of your engagement with the Philippines has been in a nonprofit capacity uh, in a humanitarian capacity. But back in the United States, you're an entrepreneur and your experience in technology, have you thought about actually moving to the Philippines? And that if you create a technology job in the Philippines or a technology company in the Philippines, maybe the technology jobs that you create in the Philippines would have more of an impact uh, than some of the things that you're doing. And so when the Philippine ambassador posed that question to me, uh, you know, Rexy was the first person that I called. I said, hey, man, like, you know, what do you think about this conversation? And then Rexy shared his passion to also start an enterprise. And we both quickly realized we couldn't do it on our own. So very similar to that movie, The Marvel's the Avengers, we went on a recruiting spree going all over the country uh, looking for uh, Filipino heroes. We went to Washington, D.C. We went to New York looking for Hulk. We went to Silicon Valley, San Francisco, L.A. looking for Thor, uh, you know, all the all the different heroes. And, and once we had about five uh, uh, initial class of five, we all quit our jobs and, and, and moved over to the Philippines uh, to start Kumu. And so from that foundation, uh, it, it was really interesting. It, if you look at it, uh, you know, Bello and Minette also said that, you know, we're the social media capital of the world. And uh, a lot of this inspiration actually came from this fact that there was a lot of opportunities building a consumer internet company that prioritized the voices of an entire market. So very early on, you know, we looked at research, we saw what WeChat did in China, or what Kakao Corp did in the Korean market. But then in emerging markets, we saw what Gojek was able to do building a $10 billion uh, you know, on-demand services app, prioritizing the voices of Indonesians through a combination of, you know, a, a Uber meets Postmates, uh, meets all sorts of different, um, you know, basically what they call a super app. And then what really inspired us was VNG Corporation building a $2 billion app ecosystem for the Vietnamese market through a strategy of social uh, mobile gaming before they went into um, other uh, plays like like uh, fintech. So uh, our, our first initial uh, uh, app was a messenger app in February 2018 that not that many people cared about. And um, this is why it was so important for us that before we uh, made that decision to pivot, we looked at the data and saw that a feature in the background, which was live streaming, was actually something that our cohort data was showing that we were getting some early product market fit. And after taking a qualitative analysis of our user base, especially the ones who were using it the most, uh, we made the decision to pivot into live streaming in August 2018. And so that's when we quickly became um, the fastest growing uh, social app in the country. Uh, millions of people started downloading the app. And uh, what was really interesting about that context is we were coming across this aha moment with our millennial and Gen Z audience, where from a content creator perspective, Gen Z's and millennials appreciated Kumu because as a live environment, you're not pretending that your life is perfect. 
uh, like on a photo platform, say like a, on an Instagram, or you can't hide behind a, a keyboard and engage in toxic behaviors like you see on Twitter and Facebook. So there was something real, raw and authentic about expressing yourself in a 100% real time, raw, live format. But then on the other side, if you look at the, the way that we uh, monetize and actually have a business model is the way that the viewer recognizes the content. And so if you look at virtual gifts, turn on your camera, be yourself and make money through animated gifts. That's exactly how content's being recognized. You're not recognizing content with a view. You're not recognizing content with a like. You're recognizing content and in, you're just sending a microtransaction, a virtual gift with actual monetary value. And I, I like to call it a, a digital version of busking. You know, uh, you know, for those who have been in the Bay Area or in, in Los Angeles or, or even in New York, street performing, right? You see someone playing the guitar uh, and they're busking. And if you like the, the music or if you like the performance, what do you do? You throw a $1 bill or a 20, you know, a 25 cent quarter into their cup or into their uh, guitar case. But what we're doing is we're doing that digitally hundreds of thousands of times every single day across uh, millions of viewers uh, all over the world. And so from that foundation, uh, really the business uh, started to grow. Uh, and so Rexy, from there, did you want to, and then, yeah. So from there, uh, quickly our engagements per view, uh, you know, in, in May, March 19, we're around 30,000. Uh, we grew from 30,000 monthly active users to a half a million monthly active users, now well north of 2 million monthly active users. Uh, from engagements per view, uh, 3.9 engagements per view, which is uh, far, far higher than um, other platforms like YouTube, TikTok, uh, Facebook, and Instagram. And this is what was really cool. Because of our business model, we not just became the number one top social app in the Philippines, and the number one top grossing app in the Philippines, the business model, because of the Filipino diaspora, uh, in Canada, just recently, we became the number four highest grossing social app in Canada because of the amount of uh, Canadian Filipino spend and also this new trend of people uh, really embracing uh, Filipino culture, similar to how there are global fans of people who are interested in Korean pop, or uh, Japanese pop. And so in, in Canada, we became the number four highest grossing social app. In Hong Kong, the number five highest grossing social app. In markets like Norway, the number eight highest grossing social app. We even peaked in the, uh, actually right now, uh, we're, we peaked as high as the number 15 highest grossing social app in the United States. And so collectively watching, uh, you know, our monthly revenues grow from say around $300,000 a month to well north of uh, $4 million a month has been uh, quite uh, an experience over the past uh, year. Yeah, I, I can jump in on this part. So that's a lot of the growth on the on the user side and the revenue side. And I think what's you know what's really exciting about us is uh, on the other side of the equation, it's starting to to translate into into people's livelihoods, right? And so uh, this is what we track internally is financially successful or really more like financially sustain sustainable creators, right? If people who are able to to make uh, the equivalent of, uh, of what could be a full-time income. So two times minimum wage in the Philippines has been growing month on month from the beginning of, of January last year was just 66 people. Um, I think in uh, quarter one of this year, we were able to, to reach a thousand people who are earning a full-time a bull, uh, kind of as we, as we call it, income in the Philippines. And, uh, and that's really, you know, I think driven by that that economy that Roland was mentioning, and 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 people who are joining, that a lot of them are, a lot of them are, and, and we're kind of most excited about the people who, uh, they're not creatives by, uh, they're not creatives by by career by vocation, right? They 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 have a, a job that they they have a different passion for music or for comedy uh, or just for kind of engaging engaging an audience and uh, and they go on Kumu and connect with that audience and even with an audience as, as little as a dozen to to a hundred people they can uh, they can earn enough to uh, to for it to be their kind of primary source of, um, of, of you know, of making a living. Um, but on, uh, on top of that, especially over the past six months, um, and with, with 
uh, COVID and the quarantines affecting affecting the incomes of um, established creators and cr kind of creators by trade. Uh, we've we've also started to see people like in the theater community, uh, uh, starting to to use Kumu as their platform to perform um, and uh, and make up for for the earnings that they might have lost uh, or people who you know they might have a, a million uh, or several million followers on on platforms like TikTok or Instagram. Uh, in this particular case, there was somebody who who would be performing uh, every, I think at the time every every weekday at lunch, she would perform at a lunchtime uh, a lunchtime variety show. Um, she'd take an hour or two hours to get there, another hour or two hours to get back in, in Manila traffic, um, and spend most of the day just preparing, doing makeup, rehearsing, kind of being yelled or yelled at to go around on set. Uh, but now she's realized she's realized kind of through Kumu that that she can make the same amount of money, um, have more control over her time, and spend all of it uh, just not not having to go, not having to send traffic, uh, not having to to do all the prep work, but really just spending all of it engaging her fans um, and and going deeply with the people who uh, who enjoy her content and. Uh, so that's something that we're really excited about growing, you know, from a thousand people to hopefully to, uh, ten thousand over the course of the next the next few years, um, and kind of as a as a company, you know, uh, within that that segment, the virtual gifts and the advertising and the entertainment um, live stream format, we feel like that can grow it in the same scale, ten uh, x over the next. Um, the next few years. Um, outside of that, we've seen in, in economies like China um, that the live streaming actually reaches a much, much broader audience and kind of breaks out beyond the niche. And that's uh, more than half of it is driven not by the entertainment formats, but by uh, kind of gaming and e-commerce, uh, which we haven't, we've, we've only really started to, uh, to explore uh, and we feel like uh, can be a big, a big frontier for our growth over the next few years, uh, and then long, long term, three to five years, or I guess that 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 will happen in, in a flash, right? But in a three to five year, in a three to five year timeline, um, we're really looking at going back to to the vision that Roland had talked about earlier. Um, not just a single product, not just a, a live streaming app, but how can we be uh, more like Kakao in Korea, for example, in terms of an ecosystem of digital products or, or Tencent in China, where it's not just products that they build, but also kind of how they invest and support in um, uh, in indirect ways and, and uh, as as an investor and, and partner to, to the other, in our case, what, what are the other breakout technology companies that will come out of the Philippines in the next, in the next few years? Um, and so we see a lot of growth potential there at the local level. And then kind of the last thing I'll add is just at the, the kind of global level, uh, what a lot of people don't kind of factor in when they look at the, the macroeconomics of the Philippines is just that there is this, this diaspora that's 10% of the global Filipino population, but uh, makes a this is just a rough um, calculation of if you take the the amount of people in the Filipino diaspora and multiply that by the GDP per capita uh, of each of those countries that actually doubles the the kind of economic opportunity that you're looking at and that's continuing to grow uh, as as more people go abroad and as, as more of that money flows into uh, to the Philippines so I'll end there kind of on my side just so we have some time to you know go through questions and, and talk about the story a bit more. But Okay, great, Rexy. Thanks very much. Before we get into more kind of discussion, I got to ask you, so you were one of the five heroes that Roland was looking for? <laughs> or how did you meet? How did you get into this? Yeah, well, for me, I mean, as, as Roland had mentioned, I, uh, I spent the first, my first five years after graduating in 2014, um, Basically, uh, I, I was working full time on, on this nonprofit that I had founded to bring Filipinos back from the from the U.S., from Canada, from from Europe, uh, just from different parts of the world, and bring them back to the Philippines to work with um, nonprofits, social enterprises, and eventually tech startups. Uh, and in that, I think probably year in year three or four, we had started to kind of mature from just a, a volunteer-led organization to a bit more of a, we're trying to, to build more of a 
uh, some formal structures and part of that was building out our board of directors. Uh, and, and I found Roland actually on LinkedIn um, and, and was kind of, wow. yeah, just, yeah, I think his profile as a, as a Filipino who was, had built, had, had spent most of his time in the technology space, but was also active in, um, uh, in, I think at, at the time there was a, it was a, there was a foundation that, uh, he was working on that was kind of focused on how do you unlock the global Filipino community to support the Philippines. Um, and I think we, we started our conversations from there. He became a board member. We started working together uh, in the context of, of my nonprofit for a few years. But uh, over the same few years, we just every time we'd meet up, we'd talk about, you know, what what are kind of other things that we can do that, that can scale at a, at a greater okay, level. Okay, so it was really the this, two of you that went yeah. out and found the five heroes. Yeah, pretty you much. Kind of, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I got a few technical questions for both of the entrepreneurs, uh, Kumu and also Edamama. First of all, with regard to uh, Kumu, one, how do you avoid inappropriate content when it's live stream? And two, as you increase the number of performers, especially part-time informal performers, how do you have to curate the platform so that people really know how to find good quality? Absolutely. So actually content moderation is actually one of our biggest differentiators. We actually call it more of a cultural tech than a, um, a pure technology. And so uh, if you, there's a, a really landmark stat, um, uh, writer, uh, his name's Eugene Y uh, in product. And he talks about this whole concept of status as a service for, for social platforms. And one of the things that we do is we give status to people who have the ability to content moderate. Very similar to say the way Reddit has Redditors or Wikipedia has an army of editors. Uh, we actually have uh, close to 10,000 uh, very uh, passionate fans of Kumu who we empower as uh, content moderators. Um, they, they call themselves nations, kingdoms, families, those types of things. And because of the power of the community, uh, we actually, if you look at our content moderator to active user ratio of one content moderator to every 250 active users, uh, that is actually much, much better than say Facebook at one to every 90,000 uh, active users. And so when you hybrid that with um, AI technology, image, rec image recognition technology and things like that, we have actually cut down offending content down to around, I think, two and a half minutes on average, which is uh, from our conversations with uh, venture capital firms, uh, world-class. Uh, to be able to cut down offending content in two and a half minutes is actually one of the key metrics that we're most proud of. Uh, and then, Rexy, maybe you can talk about the long tail. The long tail, uh, long tail streamer, uh, that's, a, that's one of our biggest uh, challenges, actually. But uh, Rex, go into India. My internet keeps cutting off. This because it's because I don't have a oh, yeah. because I don't have a globe line. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I caught most of it. Um, I think I think in both the content moderation, especially and on the curation, curation and, right? How mm -hmm. do you how do you? So you've got these moderators who give status to people, right? To performers, or, or no? Uh, so basically, the status is to users hey, you have the right now to moderate content. And so, because content moderation seems to be a very ugly type of thing to do, but by changing the conversation of what moderation means, which is protecting our core values, which is safety, positivity, and acceptance. And by arming our content moderators with these core values, it becomes a status symbol to actually moderate content. So we're like changing the conversation about what it means because you're, you're, you're protecting. And that's why we've actually embraced what we call social entertainment, uh, less than social media or social network, because now we could be very unapologetic very similar to Disneyland. You know, Disneyland, when someone enters Disneyland and the person looks dangerous or just seems a little bit off, you will be escorted off the premises. And so by having and really embracing social entertainment uh, and, and really utilizing Disneyland as a peg, we're able to really moderate content in a way that's very unapologetic around core values that really differentiates us from other platforms uh, that are just, you know, okay. just, yeah. Yeah, uh, great. And, Thanks. And, and, That's 
Go ahead. Yeah, and because of that, that actually that actually uh, has a spillover effect into what you talk about for content. And because of it, the content is actually a lot lighter uh, than you'll see on other platforms. I mean, the contents um, people just go on for for mental reason. They go, "Oh, cool! I just feel like being entertained." Yeah, okay. Great. So, Bella, you have a similar problem, but different kind of constraints and different kind of relationships. How do you build this platform of trust that you're talking about? Yeah, I think for us, um, it started with just our uh, sourcing strategy for products. Um, we don't operate like a typical marketplace where sellers can set up their own stores uh, within the store, right? So um, it's a bit more cumbersome for us because we have to vet products before we put them on the site. But I think that's really paid off. So we actually, uh, the philosophy we have internally is, you know, our sourcing team firstly is primarily comprised of, of parents. Um, and so the philosophy is if if we wouldn't use that product on our child, we're not going to put it on the site. Um, and I think that's been really important, um, a very important principle for us to live by. Um, so as to really, um, you know, demonstrate why we're building that trust experience for our customers. And so what we have found as a result of, uh, of doing that is um, return rates are very low on the platform. So it is very unlikely for customers to uh, complain about a product or want to return it. We see, you know, uh, return rates which are below industry average at the moment, um, which also is um, from a unit economic standpoint, um, better for the business, right? Because you find that this is really what marketplaces really grapple with is how to just pick up a lot of this stuff that people don't want um, once they've ordered it because it's just not what they expected it to be. Um, but I think there is a, it's a double-sided coin in a way because trust is also very hard. It, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to build trust, but you can also break it very quickly, right? And as they say, hell hath no fury like a mother scorn, you know, when <laughs> you get it wrong with a, with a consumer that's a mother, it, she almost takes it personally, right? So, um, you know, so it, it is a, a very high standard for us to, to position ourselves as a trust platform and then make sure we abide by it. But I think so far we've been able to really uh, persevere with it. Okay, that's fantastic. Minette, I've got a follow-up question for you. So as the fund has grown, does it become more difficult to do this kind of global investing from Manila? Do you think you'll need to move? Uh, you know, that's a question we grapple with every year. Um, I think this year, well, 2020 was kind of a big, you know, A-B test for everybody. Um, Historically, I'm very old school. I like to breathe the same air um, that the founders um, breathe. So it meant that when we invested in Wattpad, we flew from Manila to Toronto, spent 48 hours with the team, with their partners there, uh, and then flew back to Manila. We've done the same for when we've invested in, in Tel Aviv or anywhere. Obviously last year, we had no choice. We couldn't travel. Um, I think we're learning that we we can do quite a lot online. Um, we continued to make investments um, last year. Bella mentioned that we'd known each other for years, but when we when we ran diligence, um, we didn't have the opportunity to do face to face. Um, so I think um, it it takes a bit more effort. Um, I do not think we need to base ourselves elsewhere. What has made a difference though is that we have consciously nurtured relationships and conversations with other investors and other founders who are in various markets. And I've consciously built an investment committee that is more independent um, the third fund, in fact, has uh, an investment committee with one person based in Singapore, one person based in Sydney, and one person based in San Francisco. And that means that we are given the opportunity to see varying perspectives. Um, and, and that helps us. So we are learning to invest in a different way. Thanks. Uh, Earl? Our good friend Earl Valencia has a great question. 
about the health of the early stage venture capital ecosystem, especially are there enough local seed deals and are there enough seed funds uh, in the country um, to really help the Philippines grow? Oh, gosh, like every like every investor, we wish there were more. Um, I think there are more. How do I? I think we are relatively better off than when we started nine years ago, meaning there are more um, angel investors and more seed investors. Um, are there enough in absolute terms? I think no. I would love to see more investors. And I think that comes from our experience where you have to put the money and um, visibly in, in public eye so that they gain confidence. Um, but yeah, I think what we'd love to see more investors and we would certainly love to see um, more entrepreneurs coming forward. Okay, great. I've got one last question for the formal part of the session, and then anybody who can would like to ask to stay around. My last question is, what do you think um, Silicon Valley really needs to know about opportunities in the Philippines? And we'll go in order, Minette, and then Bella, and then Roland and Rexy. Um, I think... What does Silicon Valley need to know? I think a number of companies are already discovering from, so from an investor standpoint, um, it's a great consumer market. Um, it is, the people are experimental, forgiving. Um, they are novelty seeking. Um, and I think that helps for launching um, new businesses in in the consumer market okay great bella what would you say about that um i actually think the philippines could be a very powerful bridge for silicon valley into asia um you know geographically it's very it's the closest um and you know language culture cultural barriers are not as not as much of an issue um and so I think, you know, as Silicon Valley looks to expand um, and set up kind of investing um, focus into APAC more broadly, the Philippines is actually a very, very powerful gateway to do that. Okay, thank you. Roland, Rexy, what would you like to say? And this could be impact investing or ESG investing as well as, uh, you know, general opportunities in business. Yeah, I think um, just from an ecosystem standpoint, um, mine will be very quick. I think ByteDance, Tencent, and Alibaba have a huge head start on Silicon Valley uh, and the way that they, and so if the U.S. is concerned about, you know, say like a TikTok in the U.S., look at uh, the history of battles, right? In World War II, the Philippines was a key battleground. Uh, so I think from an attention fan's perspective, uh, you know, with the head start that both Alibaba, uh, Tencent, and ByteDance have here, I, I think that maybe Facebook's uh, APAC or whoever should be like looking into it because based off the conversations that we've had, yeah, outside of say like a Sequoia or a Lightspeed or whoever, um, you know, de definitely for Silicon Valley, it's definitely a very, very interesting market, especially when it comes to um, consumer internet. But yeah, Rexy. Uh, Thanks, yeah. Rexy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think the... In, in our experience, the global investors have been uh, kind of, I think, consistently surprised at the when they realize the size of both the Philippine local market and also when you when you layer the the global Filipino market on top of it. Uh, and I think that's something that you know will in in five to ten years time right become less and less of a surprise as more people kind of wake up to it. And so the sooner people start paying attention, uh, start placing their bets. Um, it is it is still a bit tough to find kind of the right early stage uh, deals and the early stage companies that that have the potential to to really scale. But um, but I think it's it's more of a question of of kind of when, not if, in in the next five to ten years, uh, yeah, the next one, two, three uh, breakout technology companies that that become you know the 
among the top 10 largest companies in the country, as you've seen like, again and again in, uh, in economies around the world, um, it, it's, it's, it's going to happen, right? And so, uh, so that's something that, yeah, I, and I think, I think people are starting to get there. I mean, in, in our, what, what, one of the silver linings of, of COVID as well is, is that because you're forced to do the Zoom, uh, Zoom meetings and Zoom deals, people are more open to, to investing in places that, that you know, uh, that they might not have been as comfortable with before, just because everyone is a bit more even playing field in terms of not being able to meet in person. Uh, and, and that's been kind of our experience too in, in recent like uh, deal processes as we, we've gotten more conversations with people in the United States with funds in, uh, in China and Europe. Um, uh, I think there's a forced openness in a sense uh, that comes with this situation. Okay, thank you. Everyone, this has been an incredibly informative session. Uh, I'm, I'm forced to use a word I absolutely think is over, overused and, and so I avoid as much as possible. This has been awesome. Mineta, uh, uh, Bella, Roland, Rexy, thank you so much for your presentations and for your candid discussion. Uh, I want to invite everybody to come back next week at this time. We have a session on healthcare entrepreneurship in China. But uh, for now, if you'd please join me in thanking our speakers, we'll call an end to the session. <laughs>